Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of Tulip TV, a Dutch-Canadian show showcasing Dutch issues on heritage and culture. Hi Tom. Hi Renske. Today's a special day. It's the 5th of May, so today's Bevrijdingsdag, which is the day that we commemorate the liberation from the occupation during the Second World War. In towns and cities around Holland, uh, celebrations are being held to commemorate this event. And in Amsterdam, for example, in the Nieuwe Kerk, there will be special services, as well as on the Dom Square. Today at 8 p.m. Holland time, there will be a two-minute silence to commemorate this auspicious event. Now meet our friend Tom Bijvoet. He is the editor of Dutch, the magazine. He will come to the show regularly to talk about burning issues. Hi there. You know what? I just got back from a charming little town in central Alberta that's in Canada, called Sylvan Lake. They have a great big lake there called, very originally, Sylvan Lake as well. I went there for the speed skating. You know what speed skating is, right? That's skating really very fast without a stick. Now you may have seen those guys going around hockey arenas in circles, holding onto each other's backsides and tripping over little markers on the ice. That's not what I mean. I mean real speed skating. 50, 100, 200 kilometers on canals and lakes. In Holland, that is sort of a national pastime, and I can recommend it to anyone. If you can ever get to Holland when the canals are frozen over, you will never forget it. Most people will take some time off work and go skate in one of the many tours that get organized. Maybe it's the muffled sound of winter. Maybe it's the hypnotic swaying motion of the long strokes on the ice, the most efficient form of locomotion that human beings can engage in with their own muscle power alone. Or maybe it's the abundant availability of hot aniseed milk and pea soup from little shacks along the frozen canals, enhanced by the naturally induced endorphins of outdoor physical activity. But whatever it is, on the ice, the usually highly strong, stressed, strapped for time Dutch turn into the mellowest, politest, and most helpful people you have ever met. It's hard to believe, I know, but it's true. But if you can't make it to Holland at the drop of a hat, there's Sylvan Lake. Every year, the Foothills Marathon Speed Skating Association organizes a tour in some races. They clear a five kilometer track on the ice, two feet thick at least, and manage to recreate the atmosphere of Holland on skates. Very nice people who chose to escape the rat race in Holland and come to the wide open, sparsely populated prairies of Western Canada. And that creates a natural camaraderie all in itself. But that's for some other time, I suppose. All I can say for now is, if you want to experience real Dutch winter activity and hospitality on this side of the ocean, plan a trip to Alberta sometime in February of next year. I know I'll try to be there again. If you want to know more about Holland and the Dutch, at home and abroad, check out our magazine at DutchTheMag.com. I am Tom Byfoot, editor of Dutch The Magazine for Tulip TV. This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Canada to Leave is the online community for the Dutch living in Canada and the Canadians living in the Netherlands. Canada to Leave, wherever you live. It is Saturday, February 25th, and we're in Sylvan Lake, Alberta for the North American Marathon Speed Skating Championships, which are being held on Sylvan Lake today. It's a beautiful uh, day out here. It's snowing, it's blowing, and we're all getting pretty chilly. But once we're going and once we're skating, we'll all be very warm. So they kick off at nine, and we're gonna be talking to Mike Messing, who is the chair of the organizing committee. Mike Messing, I'm the chair of the Foothills Speed Skating Marathon Association. We put on this event. Okay, and how long have you been putting it on? Uh, this is uh, about year nine. We had a two-year uh, hiata that we didn't organize anything. We picked up the, uh, the pace again uh, three years ago. And this is now uh, the, the third year in kind of a new organization. Okay, and, and these are the official uh, North American Marathon Speed Skating uh, Championships, is that right? 
Yes, that's correct. We had yesterday the official 25-kilometer race, and today we have the 100-kilometer race. Okay, and that's kicking off at 9 o'clock uh, this morning. Yes, yeah. And how many skaters are you going to have in the race? Uh, I'm not sure. Most people actually register just before the race. Yesterday we had about 75 to 80 people participating in the 25-kilometer race. The day before we had a 50-kilometer race. There was not an official uh, Speed Skate Canada race, but a race that we put on ourselves to make sure that the whole organization, that the timing and everything would work for uh, yesterday and today and we had about uh, 55 people there. It's a very select group of, of skaters that actually can and will do the 100 kilometers. Uh, every year it seemed like we get a few more, but if, if we have anywhere in between 60 and 85 participants, I think we're doing good. Okay, and now you're organizing a tour this afternoon uh, as well, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we have a tour at one o'clock, and then uh, all the local people that uh, want to come and skate you don't have to have speed skates, can be on hockey skates, can be on any kind of skate you, you have. And then uh, we stamp, so you can do one lap, five kilometers, or you can do 10 laps and do the 50 kilometer uh, tour. And we stamp every time, and when you're done with the stamping, then you go and get a, a medallion as a kind of a keepsake for participating in the tour. Okay, so you've got a five kilometer lap on, on the lake here. Um, how much work and time does it take to prepare that? Oh, it's an, it's an incredible amount of work. It's, we actually started about two weeks ago. Uh, first of all, of course, we have to make sure that we have enough ice thickness to uh, get a grader on the ice, because that's the heaviest piece of equipment that we have to use. What, what do you need for ice thickness? We, we say to ourselves, we need a minimum of two feet. Um, so two weeks ago, we, uh, we scraped off the top layer of snow. Uh, then we went on with brushes and uh, removed all the loose snow that was still left behind by the grader. Then we drilled about 50 holes all around the track and used manure pumps to, uh, and tractors to actually flood the whole five kilometer uh, yeah, uh, track. And uh, we did that uh, about two times. Then we went over it with our own Zamboni uh, to kind of get all the unevenness out of the ice. And after that, we go on it with hot water uh, and a kind of a carpet we drag behind to kind of fill in all the small cracks and all uh, to make it nice and smooth and get a real hard surface on top of it. I think actually this year we have one of the best track conditions ever. So they shouldn't have too much problem with cracks in the ice and then snow on top of it. And then of course you get, usually you get some falls and, uh, but I think we should be okay. But it's, as long as it doesn't start snowing really hard, we should see a pretty fast time. Okay, that's uh, that's interesting. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, just final question. This is all volunteer uh, labor here, right? It is 100% volunteer. It's uh, all that we we rely a lot on uh, donations. Uh, we have a few really nice companies that actually support us year after year, uh, and then we have a, a kind of a hardcore uh, group of people that help us out every year as volunteers. Without any of them without the sponsors and without the volunteers there is no way you can put this on okay well thank you very much i'm sure you're very busy so i won't keep you any longer but thank thanks you. thanks for the interest we're talking to one of the racers here um could you just uh, introduce yourself briefly yeah i'm uh, ben uh, ben Verkamp from uh, panoga alberta and i'm uh, i'm here to skate uh, the 100k have you skated in any, any of the other races uh, earlier in the week yeah i skated the 50k on uh, on thursday yeah and how did you do in that uh two hours and 20 minutes that sounds pretty good. What uh, what position that you end in? Uh, uh, 18, I believe. Yeah. So do you expect? Uh, what kind of time do you expect? Um, aiming for the five hours. Five hours. So uh, we'll be watching you coming in. So I noticed that you're wearing uh, ski boots. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a little bit more support uh, around the ankle, and uh, it's a little low, lower to the ice. So uh, yeah, quite comfy. I'm warm. Uh, um, so those. Um, uh, boots clip on to yeah. skate blades? Yeah, they clip on on skate blades and also on cross-country uh, skis. Okay, and you do cross-country skiing as well? No. <laughs> okay, well it's very handy anyway. Yeah. So uh, I wish you lots of luck and uh, hope you're good. Uh, you live in uh, Pinoca, Alberta yeah. and uh, you're, you're Dutch, right? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So how long have you been in Pinoca? Uh, four years. And uh, what you do there? A dairy farm. Uh, sorry, a dairy farm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. How's farming in Alberta? It's uh, it's really good, yeah. 
Okay, well, thanks a lot uh, for talking to us. Good luck in the race. This is Tom Bijfoot reporting from Sylvan Lake, Alberta for Dutch the Magazine and Tulip TV. And now we deal with a subject which resonates closely with Holland and for which Holland is renowned, and that is flowers and tulips. Kokenhof is a destination renowned by tourism around the world and is located between The Hague and Amsterdam. I remember as a young boy actually being taken by my grandfather to, to go and see the fields and being surrounded by a sea of colour. That is a very nice memory, Tom. I actually am not sure if I ever visited Keukenhof, but I should check with my parents, really. What I do know, though, is that CNN rated Keukenhof as one of the top destinations for 2012. The Netherlands. Lowland protected from the sea by dikes and dunes. And behind those dunes, bulb fields and more bulb fields. Like colorful patchwork quilts draped over the land. The Netherlands is a country of flowers. And tulips in particular are associated with this country worldwide. So it's no wonder that thousands of people flock here each spring, especially to see the Kogenhof, Europe's most beautiful spring garden. In this park, which covers over 30 hectares of land, many millions of bulbs are planted each year in enchanting compositions. Hundreds of species of tulips and many other flowers create a dazzling splash of color when the Kirkenhof opens its doors to the public. The Kirkenhof was laid out 50 years ago. The original idea was to create an exhibition garden, the perfect surroundings for growers and exporters to present their products. Its creators could not have dreamt that the Kirkenhof would later attract almost a million visitors every year. And yet people do not get in each other's way. The grounds are extensive and the wide footpaths stretch for 15 kilometers. Just occasionally, you must be patient if you want to take that one special snapshot. Flowers are not all the Kirkenhof has to offer. It also has avenues with fine old trees, like the Beach Avenue, a favorite with visitors.
Once, some 600 years ago, the estate on which the Kirkenhof lies belonged to Jacoba of Bavaria, Countess of Holland. In those days, tulips and bulbs were unknown. And yet Countess Jacoba's memory is preserved in the name Kirkenhof, which recalls her gardens and hunting grounds. Ik, Jacoba, Hertogin van Bayern, Grafin van Holland. This area was used mainly to grow food to feed her court, which is why it was called Kirkenhof, or the court's kitchen garden. The Kirkenhof was it toen nog niet. Maar hier waren landerijen waar ik regelmatig op valkenjacht ging. Canada to Leave is the online community for the Dutch living in Canada and the Canadians living in the Netherlands. Canada to Leave, wherever you live. This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. The Kirkenhof also has a policy of allowing other kinds of artists to exhibit their work in the park's best spots. If the flowers inspire them, it's all to the good. Almost as typically Dutch as the tulip, perhaps, is the barrel organ. The music certainly gives the outdoor cafes a happy atmosphere. The Kirkenhof also has several restaurants, a small playground, and a field with animals. Although the tulip has come to symbolize Holland, its origins lie thousands of miles away. The first tulips grew in the Tibetan Himalayas, but they looked very different from the cultivated species we know today. The old trading routes later brought them to Turkey. Tulips were always much loved in Turkey. They stood for the hope of a new life after death. In Topkapi Palace, we find 16th century tile tableau displaying stylized tulips. Austria, Vienna, the imperial court. In the 16th century, Carolus Clusius was the overseer of the emperor's botanical gardens. Clusius had a thirst for knowledge, 
and asked the emperor's Flemish ambassador in Turkey to send him some tulip bulbs. Ambassador Ogier Gislain de Buzbek was happy to oblige. Later, when Carolus Clusius became director of the botanical gardens in Leiden, he took the bulbs with him and wrote books about them. Before long, tulips won the hearts of the well-to-do, who would happily part with a few gold coins for one magnificent flower. A brisk trade arose in flower bulbs, and prices were driven sky high. Nowadays, a bunch of tulips is within everyone's reach, and the trade in tulips and other flowers and plants has become a major industry in the Netherlands, with an annual turnover of billions of euros. The flower auctions are the hub of this trade. They are the throbbing meeting places of supply and demand. Dutch flowers are flown to all parts of the world every day, brightening people's lives in countless countries. Back to the Kurgenhof. Autumn. The park is closed but the peace and quiet are deceptive. Dozens of people are busy designing next year's exhibits to amaze next spring's visitors with an overwhelming show of colors. Six million bulbs must be planted now. This is often done in layers so that new ones emerge when the first have finished blooming. And then the designer too must wait until spring. Only then will he and his staff see the fruits of their labors and the surprises that nature has in store. One thing is certain, there will be visitors galore, more and more as the season progresses. The Kirkenhof has become a household word with flower lovers everywhere. They will come to look, to smell, and to gaze in wonder. And there are also the theme gardens, where visitors eager to plan their own gardens can gain ideas and find useful information. In the 50 years of the Kirkenhof's existence, more than 35 million people have enjoyed its ever-changing pageant of flowers. The vision, cherished by its creators, has become a reality. In the meantime, the grounds have been expanded to include the Zomerhof, or summer gardens. Here we shall find summer flowers such as dahlias, lilies, gladioli and begonias, with the premiere in the Jubilee year. The Kirkenhof hopes that the new exhibition will not only ensure the park's future, but set a new record for numbers of visitors. Because no one who has ever visited the Kirkenhof can conceal that delight. Kirkenhof è incredibile con la varietà di fiori e di colori che si trovano. Veramente si trovano delle varietà incredibili. Qui è una cosa incredibile, questo parco è enorme e ha tutto tipo di colori, tulipane del blanco al negro. Franchement, je viens de France et j'ignorais qu'il pouvait y avoir autant de merveilleuses tulipes. Ik vind Kirkenhof prachtig. Lido, wow! Kirkenhof is un bonito jardin. Diese schönen schwarzen Tulpen da. I love the way the grounds are laid out. Thanks. Loved being here.
This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. So don't forget, if you want to follow us or support Tulip TV, you can do so via Twitter, Facebook or YouTube, or the old-fashioned way, just talk to your friends. We are independent producers, so we solely rely on donations by viewers like you. We don't get any other funding. If you're interested in helping us out, you can go to our website and click on Donation, or you can email us. Thanks for watching and dag allemaal! And tot volgende week!